don't know if you've noticed this. I think. Is that on? Yeah, that's on. I don't know if you've noticed this, but people, um, we have a tendency to love to talk about the things that we're passionate about, which makes sense. But one of the things I learned early on as a youth pastor is if a new student walked into our, one of our programs or, or it was introduced to uh, our group, that if I could find the thing that, that they were passionate about, if I could start a conversation with them about whatever that was, then I had a far greater chance of making them feel welcome and included in our community, like there was belonging there. And sometimes that was really easy. Sometimes their, their things were, were similar to mine, and so they would talk about sports or some of the various activities that they were in at school or maybe a particular uh, television program that they were into, and, and we would talk about these things. Sometimes it was really hard. Um, I'm not a music guy. I don't know much about bands, and if that was their thing, like I had to do a lot of almost like research to, to kind of engage in a conversation or if they're into anime or something like that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what we're talking about. But if you could get them going on the thing that they're passionate about, then you could get to know them and you could make them feel like they belong here in this place. I love to talk about the things I'm passionate about. I love to talk about my family. I love to tell you about my beautiful wife and my three beautiful daughters. My youngest one was in the VBS video there, thoughtfully making a s'more. So cute. I love to talk about Chapel Street Church. I love telling people about what God is doing here. You want to get in a conversation that's going to be way longer than you want it to be? Come ask me about the Mill Creek campus. I'll talk your ear off. I, uh, as it kind of works down the way, if, you know, when I get in conversation with people, you'll hear me talk about goofy things like Ohio State football. I love to talk about woodworking because that's my hobby and it's what I do on the side. When uh, a few months ago when Eric Robertson moved up here, he was moving from Kentucky, he had a black walnut tree that had fallen on his property that he had milled into lumber. And he was like, look, I've got nothing to do with this. Do you want it? Like a thousand board feet of black walnut tree. I mean, I was like over the moon, you know, I, and I couldn't stop talking about it. Like my kids would get embarrassed in public places because if I could turn any conversation in a way to tell people about how I had been given all of this American black walnut and what I was going to do with it and all the exciting things, like my kids could kind of glaze over and start walking away. Like, Here goes dad again. You know, if you were to sit down with the Apostle Paul, if you were going to have a conversation with him, that thing that he loves to talk about, that thing is grace. As a matter of fact, he can't stop talking about it. When he's writing his letters in the New Testament to these, these new and oftentimes struggling churches, he continually returns to the truth of grace. Because he understands if, if they don't get grace, if they don't understand God's unmerited and unearned favor, his, his love for us, then they're going to struggle to understand nearly everything else about the Christian life. They're going to struggle to understand what faith in Jesus looks like, about forgiveness of sins. Grace is essential to all of it. It's foundational, and, and Paul keeps talking about it over and over and over again. This summer here at Chapel Street Church, we've been in a series entitled Uncomfortable Grace. We've been looking together throughout the New Testament about what grace is and what it does and, and how we experience it, receive it, how we get it in our lives. And we're calling it uncomfortable grace because in order for us to understand grace, in order for us to live in grace, we first have to come to the place where we acknowledge our need for grace. Grace is uncomfortable because to get it we have to enter into our brokenness into our shame we have to recognize our desperate need for a solution that you and i can't provide for ourselves and we don't like that it's uncomfortable also, for you and I to extend grace, in order for us to show that to someone else, it requires us to enter into their brokenness. 
So grace then is, is messy. And we don't like to get messy. It's uncomfortable. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jeff was preaching on John chapter 1 how grace became one of us, how it dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace is a person. Last week, Pastor Brian um, looked at Ephesians chapter 2, another one of Paul's letters, where he reminded us that we are saved by grace. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. This is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This morning, now, we're going to look together at another one of Paul's letters. Another instance of his um, insatiable desire to talk about grace. And we're going to see if, if last week we were talking about how grace impacts our future, how it saves us. This week, Paul wants us to understand how grace impacts the life that you and I live in the here and now, in the presence, in our everyday lives. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, I'm actually going to back into 5 a couple of verses, and we're going to start there. 5 verse 20 through 6 chapter 2. It says, Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? As we begin to think about how Paul wants us to understand what grace, how grace impacts our life in the here and now, we need to begin by understanding what I'm calling the size of grace. The size of grace. I don't know if this is theologically the right way to describe this. This is how I sort of make sense of it in my own mind. But I don't know if you have had one of those moments in your life where you have misjudged the scope and scale of something. When my family was moving from Wheaton to Batavia uh, 10 years ago this summer, when I started at Chapel Street Church, I was in charge of getting the moving truck. So I went and I, I picked something out. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is going to accomplish it. I drove it home. I started putting our stuff in it. I emptied two rooms in our house, and that thing was packed full. As a matter of fact, I had to go back, get a second truck that was twice the size of the first truck, and I filled that one to the brim. Like, I had no ability to, uh, to estimate the size of how much stuff we had. And based on the power of the internet, I am not the only one that struggles with this because I found a few other examples <laughs> where somebody is underestimating the size. Matter of fact, this next one is one of my favorites because this guy's really motivated. Put, the, put up the next picture. Is it back there? There it is. <laughs> and you gotta get that TV home and the scooter's your only option. And then this last guy, I think, is just, he's just impressive overall, so. <laughs> Here, as we're looking into Romans 6, Paul wants us to understand something about, about the scope and the scale of grace. And he does so by contrasting it with the law. He says in Romans 5, the law came to increase the trespass. So what, what is Paul ultimately saying here? See, the common way of thinking in the first century Jewish worldview was that, that God had provided his people with the law in order to restrain sin, to, to confine it. So it was sort of meant to contrast that sinful impulse that we all have in our, our lives as humans. So God gave us the law. There was a proverb in the Mishnah, which is a, a commentary on the Torah that said, the more Torah, the more life. So the implication is that life comes through obedience to the law. Paul paints a very different picture. Paul is saying that it's the law that reveals our sin. It is, it is the law that exposes our need. The law came that, 
that sin might increase so that our awareness of our need, our awareness of our own sin might increase. It's the law that ultimately reveals the disease of sin so that you and I might ultimately seek a cure. We discover that that cure is grace. In order for us to understand the scale and the size of grace, we have to understand the scale and the size of sin because as Paul says, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. See, Paul ultimately is saying here at the end of Romans chapter 5 and Romans 6, you and I can't out-sin grace. We can't out-sin grace. If you've ever had that thought enter your head that says, I am beyond God's reach. Or what I have done is beyond what God can redeem. Paul's saying unequivocally, no. If you are a high school or a middle school student here, one of the things I've seen over the years of working with students is when a student makes what they consider to be just a catastrophic mistake. They make a decision and and it's a bad decision. And they begin to understand in their head that I'm beyond what God wants to redeem. I'm outside of of his reach. And so what happens is they ultimately begin to live in an identity that was not theirs, that God did not give them. So they just continue to make damaging and harmful and and, and, uh, destructive decisions in their lives because they believe falsely that they're outside of God's grace. Paul's saying no. He says grace is bigger He's saying that, that, and you can hear Paul's passion here in this, because this is personal for him. Remember where, where who Paul was prior to his encounter with Jesus, prior to his experience of grace. Paul was living with as much law as he possibly could. And because he saw followers of Jesus as an affront to the law, then he was passionately committed to their demise. He was personally hunting down, arresting, imprisoning, torturing, and killing followers of Jesus. That's where grace found him. That's where grace met him on the road to Damascus. Grace was bigger than all of Paul's sin. This is why in 1 Timothy, when Timothy is this young friend of Paul's and he's trying to encourage him, he says this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He's saying to Timothy, look, you can't out me. No one was more committed to the law than me. And grace took care of me. Grace covered me. So it can certainly do the same for you. The story of the Bible is about the, bet- the battle between the reign and power of sin and the power and the reign of grace. And Paul now says in Romans, grace wins. Grace wins. The victory of grace over sin now prompts Paul to ask an important question. He says, should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Is the natural outworking of this if If sin, if grace covering our sin is just this incredible display, demonstration of God's power and his love for us, should we just continue to sin so that grace may abound? Paul is going to answer that question in no uncertain terms, and he says, no. No, we we saw last week in Ephesians chapter 2 how grace dealt with the penalty of sin. But now as as we look at what Paul is saying here in Romans 6, he's going to show us that not only has it dealt with the penalty of sin in an internal sense, it also deals with the power of sin. And this is where we experience the freedom of grace. The freedom of grace. Uh, A few weeks ago, the Chapel Street Church staff were on a staff retreat. And one of the team building exercises that we did was, was called Escape the Room. Has anybody ever done one of these, Escape the Room? A few of us? Essentially what this is, is they, they lock you in a room. You have four or five of you in there typically. 
And you have to solve all sorts of puzzles and clues and discover all these things in order as a team to get out of the room before your time expires. So there's a clock in the room that starts at an hour. You have one hour to solve all these clues and all these things that lets you out of the room to, to freedom. And this is stressful. Like you're, you're trying to solve these riddles and think all these things and look for clues everywhere. And, and all along, there's a clock that's counting down to your ultimate demise where you're locked in the room forever. And right there, by the door, there's a button that lets you out of the room. Like all along, I'm thinking, I can get out of this room. Like I can just go press that button. I can, I can find my way to freedom. Now, of course, that's cheating. But there's an out. Like, it, there's a way to freedom. And Paul here wants us to understand that in grace, there is a way to freedom. Let's go back now in Romans 6. Let's pick it up with this question that, that he wants to deal with here. Returning to verse 2 now. He says, Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who've died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died to sin has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Christ Jesus. Paul here wants us to understand in no uncertain terms the impact that grace has in our lives in the present. Right now, and he does so by presenting this, this, this dramatic before and after. Like I said, Paul in Romans chapter 5, he has already talked about this confident hope that we have for the future because of grace, by removing the penalty of sin. But he's saying now that as we wait for this confident hope to be realized, as we wait for eternal life with him, he wants to transform the way we live as we wait. And he says that that transformation comes with freedom from sin. Paul, Paul gives us this. He starts with the, the, the before. He talks about how in our sin, we are ultimately slaves to sin, apart from Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 8 that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Therefore, sin is the governing power in our lives. We can't overcome it. it. It owns us. But, but something changes. Now, through grace, we have been united with Christ in his, his death and resurrection. This is so important. Paul is saying, don't, don't forget what Jesus has accomplished. Don't forget the victory that he has won because when you are united with Christ, you are united with him in that victory. In verse 6, and I love this verse, he says, We know that our old self was crucified in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The language that Paul uses here to describe this transformation of the power of sin in our lives is emphatic. Paul says that we have died to sin. As a matter of fact, in every single verse that we just said, in one form or another, Paul uh, alludes to the fact that we have been died, that, that, that we have died to, or we've been crucified with. He says over and over and over again that we have died 
to sin and its power in our lives. So Paul is saying when you become a Christian, when you've been saved by grace through faith, there is a decisive shift in state. Positionally speaking, as dramatic as the difference of life to death. So again, hearkening back to what Pastor Brian talked about two weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 2, he's saying, spiritually speaking, we were dead in our sin. And now grace has made us alive. Now here in Romans chapter 6, Paul is going to tell us that we are now dead to our sin. Sin is no longer the governing power by which you and I must operate. Grace is. Grace is that power. We have been set free from the power of sin. This is a complete positional change in our lives. If you and I belong to Christ, he's not saying that we are dying to sin. Or he's not saying that you will die to sin. He's not saying that you must die to sin or that you should die to sin. He says you are dead to sin and its dominion in your life. Romans chapter 6 is the Christian's emancipation proclamation. We have been declared free. So the inevitable question then that, that emerges for each of us is if this is true, if Paul is accurate, then why do I still struggle? Why do I still struggle with sin in my life? If any of you who know me and know me well, you know fully that I am not a perfect person. That I don't always get it right. So if I have been set free from the power and dominion of sin, why is that the case? Why is that the case for us? I think it can be a couple reasons. One, I think sometimes we have yet to be united with Christ. It's possible to be in a room like this, to, to be here and worship, to be around the gospel, but not be in the gospel. And the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, have I made a decision to accept the free gift of salvation? Have I received his grace on my life? Have I been united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection? Romans talks about it as a free gift where we confess, we admit our need for him. We put our faith saying that I recognize I can't, I can't deal with this problem of sin in my life. I can't overcome it. So I am going to put my faith in him and his ability to overcome it. He becomes the Lord of my life. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves is have we been united with Christ? If that's not the case, today is the day, friends. Today is the day to make that decision. But then if we have, why do we still sin? Why do we still struggle? Because I think oftentimes we forget. We forget that there is a difference between being given a new position and living and realizing you are in that position. You can still experience life as a slave even after you've been given your freedom. Paul's going to deal with this more in Romans chapter 7. So Paul's ultimately not talking about a kind of Christian perfectionism where you and I uh, never revert back, where we never struggle with sin. Paul is saying that fundamentally, positionally, we have been set free. If we've been united with Christ, we have been set free. Our culture wants to tell us to pursue our own desires. But Paul is saying that's, that's still slavery. Freedom isn't doing whatever our hearts desire. Freedom is living according to God's design for your life. And that's what grace offers us. In Jesus, in grace, when that is our governing power, he's saying you are under new management. In Christ. Which ultimately leads us then to the life of grace. And this is Paul's heart. He wants you to experience the life of grace. When, um, 
when I was getting married on my wedding day, I was back in, in a room in the church and na- nervously pacing around and my grandpa dining here knocked on the door and asked if he could talk to me for a moment. Um, I'd grown up around my grandpa. I knew him well and, and I was so happy to see him and he came in and, and he just handed me this little pamphlet. Um, and it was small and, and I could tell right away that it was, it was about marriage. And he said, this was so instrumental in me understanding what it means to be a husband and a father. And he said, I just want you to read it. Gave me a big hug and, and, and walked out. I can tell you that I have no idea what that pamphlet said. Um, and, and it's not what I remember about that moment. What I caught in that moment was my grandfather's passion that as I started my marriage, as I entered into this relationship with my wife, that I would start understanding what it means to be a husband and father. He wanted me to get it. He wanted so desperately. Like I kind of got the idea, and I don't know the whole story, but that, that he felt like in his life there was some point in time where he was operating under one idea of what it meant to be a husband and a father, and then he read this pamphlet or somebody mentored him, and it totally changed everything, and he wanted me to start there. He wanted me to start at that place as I walked down the aisle. Here in Romans 6, we, we see Paul's passion for us to get it, to live in it. This is back in verse 12 now. He says, let not, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as Uh, your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are under, not under the law, but under grace. Let me say that again. For sin will have no dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. You can hear Paul's heart, his passion, his desire for you. He wants you to live it. He wants you to experience it. In verse 14, Paul is definitive and he is authoritative. He says, sin has no dominion over you. Sin shall not be your master. Sin will not rule over you. Sin de- uh, Paul depicts sin as this master and Lord who has lost its controlling power. And verse 14 is both a declaration and a promise. Sin is not your master. You, you brothers and sisters, are not under the law. You, my friends, are under grace. The grace-filled life is a life of victory. It is a life of surrender. We have victory over sin because we have surrendered our life to Christ. And it really is this practical. Just this week, I've been thinking, how do I do this? What does this look like? One of the things I'm trying to do every morning when I get up and I look at myself in the mirror is saying, you are under grace. The law, the governing power of your life is not sin, it is grace. So operate like that. I'm starting each day trying to tell myself, remind myself, begin my day by understanding that truth, that reality, so that I might increase my chances of living in it so that I won't revert back to an old master. We have victory over sins because we surrender our life to Christ. So the question becomes, who owns you? Sin or grace? If you are united with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection, then you belong to Jesus. And grace is the governing power of your life. Paul says, go. Go. Live in grace. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that in Jesus, through Jesus, and what you brought in your death, burial, and resurrection, Lord, that we can be found in you. 
that we can experience Your grace anew. That we can live in the power and dominion of grace and that sin has no claim on our lives. So Jesus, I pray that we would experience it. Remind us again each and every day that we live not under the law, but under grace. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.